It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword again with the cold. Okay, so I've got a super cool show for you this week. Today's guest is guitarist Mike Slammer. Mike's first band, City Boy, recorded five records with legendary producer Mutt Lang. And then Mike's career took off in all kinds of directions, including film and TV scores, writing for other bands, session playing, including playing a bunch on the first two Warrant releases, and a bunch of his own band and recording projects. There's a lot to cover in this one, so let's get right to it. Just make sure you stick around at the end for a show announcement. Here we go. Here is Mike Slammer. Well, I'm from Birmingham, England. Um, grew up in England. Uh, I didn't leave England until I was 25. That's when I moved to the States. But um, uh, my family, um, my music, I mean, my dad, uh, he used to play piano in the Air Force and uh, back in uh, World War II. And uh, so he was, he was musical. He loved uh, blues and jazz. Um, and my mom... She always loved uh, music. She played a bit of piano and liked to sing. But uh, so, I, yeah, I mean, my family was musical. So they were musical, but not necessarily musicians in the, the professional no. sense, anyway. Yeah. No, 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 no. They both, uh, both my parents just did it for fun. You know, um, it was just a hobby, something they loved. Uh, but yeah, neither of them were professional musicians. Uh, now, my dad uh, bought me a guitar. I think when I was eleven an acoustic guitar, um, and he, 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 I think he taught me three chords on it, and uh, <laughs> those are probably the only three chords I played for about a year, and uh, sort of lost interest in it, um, and then it was probably about uh, 18 months later, probably I was about 13, um, and he, uh, he decided to send me to music lessons. Um, so I went to guitar lessons, and I lasted about uh, three months, and then I got kicked out. <laughs> what did you do to get kicked out? <laughs> what did I get kicked out? I wasn't yeah. learning to read the music. So he was giving me passages to learn, and, uh, well, I'll tell you the story. The day that I got kicked out, uh, I went in, I opened the book up to the piece of music he wanted me to play, and I put it up and put, put, you know, got my guitar out, I opened up the page, put my foot on the footstool, played it all the way through, and he said that was really good, except it's on the next page, the piece of music. <laughs> so <laughs> he realized I wasn't reading a damn thing. And, yeah. uh, and that was it. And back then it was very strict, so uh, uh, yeah. I got thrown out. And then I, I really, again, didn't really do much with the guitar until... Um, I think I was about 15. I came home from, I'd been playing uh, soccer at school, uh, soccer match at school. And I came home, my mum and dad were out, and I came into the house, it was probably around 7 o'clock at night, something like that, 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. And we only had three channels back then, BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And I saw on BBC Two, um, it said, um, live from the Royal Albert Hall in London, uh, farewell concert of Cream and uh, Cream, I'd never heard of them and I thought, what the heck is Cream? So I, I just put it on um, just out of interest really, just to see what Cream was um, and uh, that was it basically, that changed my whole life right there and then I sat and watched the whole concert next day went out and found Disraeli Gears and Fresh Cream, which were the only two LPs that the record store had in and uh, told my dad I needed an electric guitar, not an acoustic guitar. So he went out and bought me a cheap electric uh, a couple of weeks later. And that was it. Just started learning as many Cream songs as I could. And then, you know, that led to uh, rock, I guess, and becoming aware of other bands. Deep Purple was a big favorite of mine, too. Um, and uh, And then, you know, so from there on, that, that's what it was. It was that one night coming home from school after a soccer match and a football match and uh, seeing uh, Kareem's farewell concert. 
It's uh, it's actually refreshing to hear an answer that's not the Beatles or Kiss because I swear <laughs> it's always one or the other. You're the, one of the first people to say somebody else. It's nice. No, I mean at Eric Clapton, I, I was just uh, I don't know it, it, the way he played guitar, and uh, I mean obviously when they started Sunshine of My Love, da, 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 I oh, and then his guitar <laughs> solo, you know and. Um, crossroads. I mean, it was just, I'd never heard music like that before. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah, I'd heard the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, but uh, this was, this to me really inspired me to want to play guitar. So. And did you think that having the foundation of learning to some degree on acoustic before switching to electric, did you find that that made the electric a lot easier? It didn't at first because um, that's another story. My mum used to come in and scream at me because I'd be playing my uh, electric guitar and my fingers would be bleeding and uh, she was she used to get very concerned and upset about it because it had strings on it like railway lines, you know, and mm. uh, massively thick strings. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know any different. I mean, none of it, you know. And so uh, until I found out probably about a year later when somebody said how can you play with those strings on that guitar you know you need lighter gauge strings and then that was another revelation <laughs> yeah so, it's like playing a but, bass uh, yeah yeah I mean I I was always interested in playing football soccer and then also motorsports I was a huge motorsports fan and still am and so I used to do a bit of go-kart racing and used to play a lot of football, so I wasn't really, I wasn't a muso type of guy at that point. I mean, I loved Cream, and then I started loving, you know, the other bands that I started hearing, and it really inspired me to want to play, but I was still involved in other things, so it wasn't like a, a 24-7 thing initially, probably until I, I was probably uh, 16, when, it re when I really started getting serious about it. I guess after I'd... Uh, Somebody had told me about light gauge strings and amplifiers that you could turn up full blast and put cushions <laughs> and pillows over them so they'd distort, but it didn't blow everybody's ears out, you know, and you could play in your bedroom and that sort of thing. And then, uh, you know, once I realized how to get some distortion and some sustain and some light gauge strings on the guitar, then, uh, then, it, then it became, you know, a complete passion. It was all I wanted to do at that point then. And how long till you got into your first band? Well, um, at that point, probably around 16, um, I started playing with bands around town because um, it, was, it was funny because uh, the stuff that I would, I'd learned, and uh, I mean, Led Zeppelin was out there at, at that point too, so I learned a lot of those songs, and um, I put this little band together just with a couple of mates, somebody on bass and somebody on drums, and uh, I think the guy on drums was Paul. He went to the same school that I went to. And the guy on bass was a guy called Steve. He was, he went, we were all in the same class at school. And we were all sort of into the same sort of music. So we started going around and just playing little little gigs if we could get some. We'd only been playing probably a couple of months. We'd, we'd maybe done three or four shows. And people just started coming up to me and saying, hey, would you join our band? Because our guitar player can't play this song and he can't play the solo in this song and he can't play the solo in this song and so you know that was it so then i started playing in in various bands you know um so because i knew you know a lot of the solos and all the guitar parts for most of the cream stuff and most of zeppelin and deep purple so um that was it so then i yeah i started playing with probably about three or four local bands and what kind of scene was it at that point? Were you playing parties or were you playing underage in bars or what were you doing? Yeah, some were underage in bars. Um, I mean, most of, the guy, most of the bands I played with, everybody was a lot older than me. Um, um, I mean, there was one band I was playing with. I mean, they were like 18 and 19 and I was 16, you know. Um, <laughs> I don't remember it ever being an issue. But, uh, yeah, I would be in bars well at way under age, yeah, playing and drinking, yeah. Um, and then... Uh, Getting think, an education. Yeah, and then there was, you know, some of them were like little college gigs, 
and some with youth clubs and some, you know, that that sort of thing. It was uh, there was always there was always plenty of places to play back then, so uh, you're never short of gigs. And was there a lot of different bands that led up to City Boy, or was that no, something that happened no, pretty quick? No, just a handful of bands. Um, and then I was I wanted to at that point I was actually <clears throat> I was going to college I was doing an engineering degree and um, about two years into it I just decided that, that, that by that time I was I was well, crikey how old but by the time I was about eighteen yeah I was in I was in college and I just decided I didn't want to do the course that I was involved in I wanted to play guitar and at that point actually. Um, Another huge influence was uh, Paul Kossoff from Free. And um, I was reading about him and how old he was, and I just decided, blimey, if I want to be a success by the time I'm 21 or 22, I'd better get out of college and <laughs> start trying to find a band. So um, uh, I left college, and I just went, I, I basically, the, the biggest music store in Birmingham where I grew up at that point in the center of Birmingham was a place called Jones and Crossland so I called up and uh, the one morning and said you know uh, can I come in and interview for a, for a sales job and they said yeah sure so I went in on the bus and uh, met the owner of the store and then he spent about an hour doing everything he could to try and convince me to go back to college. <laughs> and, the responsible uh, thing. Pardon? T the responsible thing to do. It was. Well, he was a very responsible person. And um, yeah. so he was trying to, and in the end, I said, no, I, I, this is what, you know, I need to be in the music scene. I want to learn all of our different instruments. I want to be around people that are in groups and that sort of thing in bands. And he said, "Well, funnily enough, I've got another, I've got another guy working upstairs, who's just done exactly the same thing a couple of months ago. He quit college too, and he came to work here. And his name's Chris Dunn, and uh, he works up in the guitar store too. So that's when I met Chris. And uh, <clears throat> within about three or four months of us working in the in the music store, he said to me one day that he was in this band, um, this." sort of folk band and they just got a manager and the manager wanted them to go into the studio but he wanted them to have electric guitar and drums and bass uh, on a couple of the songs that they were doing so he said uh, you know do you know anybody who would come along and play bass and I said yeah I'll come along and play bass and uh, he said oh okay great I didn't know you could play bass well I'd never played bass in my life but I thought <laughs> how hard can it be I, I can play guitar okay so I went along and played bass, and uh, uh, a drummer that was coming into the shop regularly, who I was getting on quite well with, Roger Kent, who was the first drummer in City Boy, I said to him, I'm going to go down and play with these, this band. I said, I don't know anything about them, but they've got a manager, and I think they've got some gigs coming up, so they need a drummer too, so you want to come down with me and we'll do this? And he said, yeah, okay, sure. So I borrowed a bass guitar from the music store that I was working for, and uh, and a little bass amp, and we went down and we did uh, we, we I think we recorded two or three songs that night in the studio with them, and uh, we went back about a week later to record two more, and in the one song the manager wanted a guitar solo, and in, in this one song and uh, Chris went in to play it because Chris was a guitar player at that point and. Uh, he had a couple of goes at it and came back in the control room and the manager said, nah, that, 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 that's not really what we're looking for. You know, I want some sort of really good sort of somewhat rocky guitar solo. So we were sort of dead in the water. So I just said to him, can I go in and try something? And he said, well, you play bass. And I said, no, I can play guitar too. So he said, oh, okay. So I went in and did the solo and he said, well, and the manager came on and he said, I want to go back to the other song. Can you do one on that too? And I said, yeah. So we went back to the other song and I put a solo on that one. And then I came walking back into the control room and the manager said to me, okay, you're playing guitar now and Chris is playing bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how did he respond to that? Um, 
Well, I, I responded quite positively because that's I didn't I hated playing bass. So, uh, um, but Chris, he was okay with it, you know. And uh, and that was it basically. And then uh, I guess within about two or three months of uh, of that situation happening, we had a little demo tape, and then uh, the band started doing quite a few gigs, and uh, we got a record deal very quickly. It was uh, it was quite surprising. I think within about six months we had a record deal. Oh wow! Yeah. Now, was that through connections, or did you just, when, as soon as you started playing gigs, did things really take off? I think right? as soon as we started playing gigs, I mean, they had some really good songs. Um, yeah. I mean, back then, most of them were very folky, but with a bit of a, you know, a little bit of an edge to them, a bit of a rock flavor to them, with drums and bass and guitar solos and stuff. So, uh, you know, it was mainly a harmony, folk type of band, but uh, then we started getting a bit more pop and rocky, and... Uh, with the drums and with me playing guitar, and then I started co-writing with a couple of the other guys in the band, and uh, we went out and we started doing college gigs, lots and lots of college gigs and bars, and then a buzz started, um, you know, and uh, a lot of people, word of mouth, it spread really quickly, and then we started getting interest from uh, various record companies, and A&R guys started coming to see the band, and uh, and it went pretty quickly from that, yeah. Now, in terms of getting Mutt Lang involved as a producer, how did that come about? Uh, well, that came about after we signed with Phonogram and they wanted us to do, uh, you know, they said, okay, you guys need to get an album going and have enough material for an album and this, that, and the other. So we all started writing. And then our manager at that time, a Swiss guy named Rene, he, uh, he said, look, there's, uh, there's a, a producer who's just come to England and uh, I was talking to his manager the other night and uh, he'd like to hear you and uh, so he came and watched him and came up and saw us at a gig and we met him and that was Mars, he came and saw us and then uh, shortly after that uh, we decided, because we didn't know anything about producers, uh, you know, that he seemed like a really nice guy and really knowledgeable and liked the songs and he had a few ideas so it sort of sounded good so we went down and went to his flat he had a little flat in london above the dentist's office and uh, a little four track tascam tape machine and we would go down to london and spend a couple of afternoons in his in his flat putting stuff down on this four track tascam and then he would change things and mess about with things and uh it seemed to be you know we we really liked what he was the ideas he was coming up with and he really liked the band and so a few months after that we finished up at uh in oxford um recording the album mike oldfield studio and we, we did the whole thing and we did the whole thing in seven days including mixing yeah seven days that's and with mixing so was it all recorded live on the floor then well even back then Mutt was uh, an absolute workaholic, and uh, obviously he was looking to make his name too, you know, because we, we, you know, he, this was we were probably the first or one of the first bands he'd actually ever produced in the UK in England. So, and he was into uh, meditation and all sorts of stuff back then. So he would basically work twenty hours a day, and. Uh, then meditate for a few hours and then just work and work and work and work. So we, we cut we, we cut some of it. Uh, you know what? It's so long ago, I don't even rem- remember. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think... I don't remember us all recording at the same time. I remember maybe bass and drums or guitar and drums or bass and drums and guitar and then overdubbing keyboards and then vocals afterwards. Um, uh, but I don't remember us all actually recording at the same time. But, I mean, it was just constant, constant. I mean, you know, we'd be going to the studio almost 24 hours a day, round the clock. and uh, You go do three weeks with a work in a week. Yeah. And as your first big studio experience, how satisfied were you with the results? To have an album out, and I still think that first City Boy album is a great record. And I, I was really proud of it, extremely excited. You know, we're really young and we had an album out. And, 
I was, the, you know, the excitement. It, it, there was a tremendous amount of excitement about the whole thing. Um, you know, and then shortly after that, Phonogram, who we were signed with in England, you know, started us booking us gigs with other bands. And then the next thing, we were playing with Sutherland Brothers and Thin Lizzy. And it was like, oh, my God, you know, we've made it. Even though we hadn't sold a record, you know, you feel like you have. So. Yeah. Yeah. And how was the response to that first record? Um, I think it was pretty good. We got really good reviews on it. I know that. I mean, City Boy always seemed, seemed to be a critics band rather than a, you know, a mass population band. I mean, we were a little artsy. Everybody in the band had come from college and whatever. And so it was a little artsy and a, a little out there. But, uh, um, I mean, I, I remember a lot of the gigs we did at colleges really went well. Um, some of the gigs we did with Sin Lizzy didn't go that well because Sin Lizzy was Sin Lizzy and we were City Boys, so slight, <laughs> slight difference in music. Um, yeah. But I, 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 love, I loved every gig we ever did with Sin Lizzy. I, was, I watched them every night, every sound check, because uh, that was you know more rock it was more my roots of music you know coming from where i came from as a guitar player how quick did you jump back into the studio then for the second record and that was with mutt lang producing correct oh yeah yeah the yeah. First yeah, four yeah. Or five? yeah 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 um because the second album i think was uh, dinner at the ritz right yeah where we got you know tried to get even more artsy and uh and <clears throat> that was I think, if I remember, that one was done at uh, Rockfield in Wales. Um, and we had a lot more time. I think we had two weeks to do that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so that, was, that was great. We had lots of fun doing that. Said, wow, we got two weeks? <laughs> this is awesome, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, you know, you're not really... There's a lot of guys, and there's, I'm probably the one in the band with the worst memory. For these sort of things, so you have to bear that in mind. I, you know, uh, some of the guys remember every single thing, but uh, I don't. But uh, but I know we did it at Rockfield, dinner at the Ritz, and I know we had a great time doing that record. Um, and that sort of changed um, our live show after dinner at the Ritz, mainly because of that one song. It was so artsy, and we had a table on stage, and extra people would come up and. It was, um, we were a real college band then. So. Along the way, you had, you know, a pretty big single with, what, 5705? Yeah, I think that was the fourth, was, that was the fourth album, I think. Yeah, I think so. Because I think, well, hang on, we had uh, that one, then we had Dinner at the Ritz, then we did Young Man Gone West. Yeah, so Book Early, I think, was the fourth one, yeah, that was 5705, yeah. And that one took off pretty well, I think, I think that would be your first kind of success in the States then, right? I'm trying to think. We were actually on tour in the States when 5705 was released in England. Now, who were we over here with? I think we were... I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember. Um, it may have been with uh, Dower Hall and John Oates. Right. And we had a big tour, I think, and then we had to go back to England because um, the song had charted. And they wanted us to do Top of the Pops and all sorts of TV shows and that sort of thing. So, uh, um, yeah, but I think we were actually touring at that point, but uh, on that record. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then Top of the Pops, what kind of experience was that? Oh, it was, it was awesome. I mean, <laughs> you know, being in TV studios and... Yeah. going on and playing and, you know I mean it wasn't just that we were having to fly you know into Europe and do shows in Germany and, sh and TV shows in Scandinavia and uh, you know TV shows in England it, it was it was fantastic you know we, we felt we felt like superstars almost it was absolutely incredible and I think and, and then you know we got I'm trying to remember how many singles the first one sold but no five seven no five sold but I know we got, you know, we went to the presentation because we got silver or gold discs or something. And, you know, it was, it was fantastic. You couldn't beat it. You couldn't beat it. It was, it was brilliant. How big of a wave did that give you guys in terms of the success of that song? 
Did it keep you going for a while? Um, no, it was sort of a it was a mixed blessing because it was great while it was a hit and while we were sort of semi-famous um, and enjoying that sort of thing. But uh, and then the big record deal came with Atlantic. I mean, it, it basically it was a catalyst for a lot of things, but <clears throat> it was also the catalyst in some ways for the end of the band. Um, you know, uh, our, neither of our lead singers actually sang that song. It was the drummer, Roy Ward, uh, who sang 5705. And that became a bit of a, an issue because we had two lead singers up front, but the drummer singing the song. And uh, so that was sort of the, uh, the seed that uh, I think started the beginning of the problems i mean it took it took it took a while it took a while but uh it, it definitely was so uh. yeah i can see that for sure with the group of albums i think you're one of the few people that's worked with mutt lang for that extended period of time yeah uh in terms of your future work as a producer how much of an impact did working with him have on you how much were you learning from him massive it was probably one of the most important experiences of my musical career. You know, I mean, working with him on and off over a period of four or five years um, was just absolutely brilliant. He taught me so much and I learned so much, you know. He taught me so much when I was playing on how to approach certain things and uh, how to listen to certain things and how to compliment certain things it was uh it was a real education working with him i mean i know some people got very irritated with him because he you know he's he's very unique he'll hear a song and he'll once once you've sort of got the arrangement down he's almost listening to the mix in his head so he knows exactly what he wants everybody to do and how he wants them to do it before you even start cutting it and so it's sort of just taking direction from him the way he feels the song is going to be the strongest. So, um, you know, it's, I mean, to a, to a degree, it's almost like having a school teacher. So, you know, some people don't react that well to it. So, and, but, but I, to me, to me, it was, it was, uh, a wonderful education. And, and he taught me so much with, uh, everything to do with mixing microphones, positioning, uh, how to get, you know, vocal techniques, guitar techniques, all sorts of things. Um, it was a priceless education. So it sounds like you didn't come and go just to play your parts, but you were there the whole time to learn as much as you could. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember the specifics of the later albums, but I mean, I know we would go away just for two weeks with him to a cottage or some sort of house out in the country and just rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and change arrangements and try all sorts of different things, throw little sections out, come up with new sections before we would go in the studio. You know, he definitely wasn't a producer that was, uh, okay, write, <clears throat> write 15 songs and we'll pick 11 and we'll go in and record them. That was not much at all. He wanted, he wanted to go through every song with a, you know, a fine tooth comb. Before we move on to him, I'm just curious... Again, with that whole five album series you did with him, did he evolve as a producer during that time, or did he have it all there? Yeah, no, he yeah. did absolutely. Yeah, I mean, every 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 album we did with him, he always had some sort of idea about. Let's, I want to try something different here, some different techniques and recording and this, that, and the other, and sounds and yeah. It was a it was a, it did constantly evolving. Now, how did that band? It sounds like there are some early seeds with that that hit single, but how did the band finally dissolve? Well, I mean, by the time we broke up, I think we'd been together six or seven years. And, uh, you know, everybody was going in different directions. And um, when you have four writers in a band, you know, everybody's pulling different ways. And uh, there were a lot of political things going on. Pressure from outside the band as well as within the band. So... You know, <clears throat> without going into too many details and dragging up too much dirt, it was 
I think it was just like a lot of bands. You know, you get to a point where the best thing is is uh, to to not try and beat a dead horse, if you know what I mean. So now you find yourself what mid to late twenties, bands broken up. What do you do next? Um, yeah, that was that was uh, that was a pretty tough time uh, because by the time the band broke up, I mean, we I think we did one or two albums as a four piece. Um, and uh, then we just sort of broke up. That was it. There was no point in going on. We went to her and we weren't doing any gigs. And I think at that point, punk was, was really coming on strong in England. And everything that I liked and I wanted to do was uh, not current. And nobody was really interested. So I would go down to London occasionally and do some sessions for Mutt and Tim Freeze Green. Uh, Mike Shipley, the late Mike Shipley, and um, and then, but it just sort of slowly petered out, and uh, we were we were at my wife's parents' house one Christmas, um, and uh, Chris Dunn's girlfriend called us and said that uh, Steve Walsh from Kansas had left Kansas. And he was looking for a guitar player for a new band, and would I be interested? And because uh, she was good friends with Jeff Glixman, um, who was producing Kansas at that point, and apparently Jeff was a, a City Boy fan, so Jeff had suggested me to Steve. And so <clears throat> then that led to me going to Atlanta and uh, forming Streets with Steve Walsh. And you guys did a couple of records together for that band, and like how quickly did that come together, and what? kind of results did you get like i don't recall how the response to streets um yeah uh yeah, it's weird i mean we, we didn't get the response we thought we would get well steve didn't um you know, the live shows we did were great we got such a great response from our live shows um in fact some of the best live gigs i've ever done will be streets um and, you know, we could always work. We could always do 1,500-seaters, 1,000-seaters. Um, but we never we never seemed to sell the, sell the records, you know. And when you guys were playing, were you playing a lot of Kansas material or were you just... Stuck? No. No? No, no. Uh, I think after the first couple of gigs, we never played a Kansas song. Um, I know Steve wanted to do Point of No Return, and we did that a few times. Um, when we first started playing gigs. Um, but I think once we'd recorded the first album, Streets, we didn't play any kinds of songs from then on. Now, around that time, you were thanked in the credits of Pyromania by Def Leppard. <laughs> how how yeah. did that happen? I just actually just stumbled across that recently. I was looking at my record and I saw your name. How did that happen? Um, well, that's right before I went to Atlanta um, to work with... Uh, Steve. Um, I was still living in Birmingham. Um, uh, my wife and I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we were still in Birmingham. We had a house in Birmingham. And uh, I got a call from Mutt, and he said they'd been tracking guitars on this new band that he said he thought was going to be huge. Uh, but they'd been renting guitar gear and pronounce, and he wanted more. He said, you, you know, your guitars always sounded so good through your Marshalls. Um, your old vintage marshal, marshals. He said, uh, what are you doing right now? And I said, nothing. And he said, well, could we borrow your gear for a couple of months? And I said, yep. So uh, that was that was the thank you. They came up and borrowed up all my gear, all my rigs, and uh, they used them for pyromania. Did you go check out the recording sessions on that, or did you stay away? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Well, I guess he was right. <laughs> Yeah, he was. was. A, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I sort, of, I sort of wish I sort of wish I had now. <laughs> but there <you> go. <laughs> yeah, and again, now the 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 you know the the relationship he's had with Def Leppard and some of the sounds he's gotten, which were pretty unique back at that time. Did you see any of that forming early when you were working with him? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people that, that were City Boy fans and then you know enjoyed a lot of Def Leppard stuff just said that. They, they always hear so much of, of what he was doing in City Boy 
developed. He took it, you know, even further with uh, Def Leppard. Now, okay, so Streets does a couple albums and disbands at you know at some point, probably mid eighties. Yeah. Uh, what did you do next? Was it a session career starting up at that point? Well, uh, Bo Hill produced our second album, Crimes in Mind. Right. And uh, Bo and I got on like a house on fire. And, uh, I, you know, we, we, we're we still really good friends. Um, yeah, I've, and, I've had uh, him on the show. He's great. Yeah, and, uh, and I, he, <clears throat> he, he asked me, well, after we've done... Um, after Street split up, uh, we, uh, my wife and I moved up towards New York, uh, New Jersey, North Jersey, and uh, Bo was, was doing a lot of projects for Atlantic, so he would ask me, he'd call me up and ask me to come in and do sessions or ghost guitar on various albums, and so we, we started working quite a lot together, and uh, then he moved out to California. Um, uh, right around the time that, that my wife and I moved out to California. And so I carried on working with him out here. We were both in Los Angeles. And uh, he would say, hey, I need you to come down and do some guitars on this project and this, that, and the other. So we just we just kept working together. And so then, I, I, I mean, I, I, I was probably working on and off with Bo for another four or five years after that, doing sessions and various other things with him. Now, I think the the Warrant records are ones that that people have, you know, the secret came out of that, you know, that you worked on those records. And yeah. I've talked to Bo about it, and I've talked to Joey Allen from Warrant about it. Like, the, you know, that's not really, everybody knows, and it's pretty open about it, but how did you get involved in those records? Was it simply a call from Bo, and, and what kind of contributions did you make? Yeah, it was just simply a call from Bo. He called me up initially and he said, look, you know, I'm working with this band. I think they've got a lot of possibilities. And they're signed and this, that and the other. And it's sort of a touchy thing, but uh, would you, any chance you could work with the guitar players for me? So uh, I basically started working with them. You know, they would come up to the house. I mean, not lessons, but just, I guess, parts sort of almost like guitar lessons. And... Uh, <clears throat> working on parts for the songs and this, that, and the other. And then um, that went on for a little while, and then I know they did some demos, and they they were about to start cutting the real album in the studio, and Bo called me, and he said, look, how would you feel about doing the guitars on this record as a ghost player? And I said, sure, that's fine. You know, if it's okay with the guys, it's, uh, that, um, it's okay with me. So he said, okay, that would be great. So then... That's how that developed, and you know, the guys were really cool about it. So I went in and played most of the guitars. So on the f- was that on for the first two records? Did you play most of it, or was it more just most solos? of it on Dirty Rotten Filthy Stinking Rich? Yeah, yeah, and then um, quite a bit on the next record uh, was Uncle Tom's Cabin, whatever that was. Um, yeah, it's cher- the, the album's Cherry Pie. Yeah, but Cherry Pie. Yeah, not not so much on Cherry Pie. But uh, I still did quite a bit on Cherry Pie, but uh, a lot of the Do Rotten Filthy Stinking Rich. From what Bo told me, the, his perspective was that, you know, the band were, were pretty cool about it and they worked really hard on it to perform it live and they really grew as guitar players from that experience. What kind That's of perspective great. do yeah. you have on it? Um, well... I probably had a closer relationship with Joey than anybody else in the band, and Joey was always so super cool about everything. And I mean, to the point, <laughs> to the point where he would just stop by my house randomly and go, "Hey, dude, we just got an endorsement with Nike. Here's some sneakers, and hey, I just we just got an endorsement with." Um, with Calvin, here's a couple of amps, and you know he was so cool, sweetest guy, absolutely. And in terms of other session playing, what other bands did you work with? Like, I think there's a Fiona record or two that you worked on. What else did you yeah. do at that time? Yeah, I mean Fiona and a few other things. I, I played a little bit on. Uh, uh, I flew into New York and did some stuff on Kix's record, one of Kix's Midnight Dynamite, I think. Um, I, you know, I can't even remember now. Um, 
there was a lot of stuff, but uh, bits and pieces all over the place. One album that I, that you worked on was the House of Lords record, but was that as a songwriter? So did you switch yes. and start submitting songs to people? No, I was. Uh, we were doing various things, and some albums I was producing, and Bo was executive producing at that point. He was just passing projects on to me because he couldn't do enough of them. He didn't have the time to do them all. And uh, so we went through that, and then I came up to Canada, to Toronto, and worked with Wall of Silence and... Um, Canadian band and a couple of other things but then everything just sort of started to peter out and Bo moved to um, uh, Austin, Texas and uh, sort of a semi-retirement thing and I think he'd had enough of the business and he had so many hit records it didn't matter uh, and then uh, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do um, and then somebody said that uh, one of the executives at uh, Columbia Pictures was a big City Boy fan, and uh, would I be interested in meeting with him? Because maybe I could write for Columbia Pictures. So to cut a long story short, then I finished up as a staff writer uh, working for Columbia Pictures and uh, wrote stuff for a bunch of films and TV shows and um, odd songs and bits of score and that sort of thing um, <clears throat> and then during that period I, obviously I met a new group of people writers that, that I hadn't worked with before and one of the writers I met was Mark Baker and um, you know he was involved with House of Lords right? and so uh, some of the songs we started writing together finished up you know, with House of Lords now, I just want to quickly jump back to Bo Hill, and uh, we covered what you learned from working with Mutt Lang. What about Bo Hill? Did you absorb a lot from him as well as a producer? Yeah, yeah, but, but, but it was a very different thing with Bo. Um, um, I felt Bo was more of a mate <laughs> than, than anything else. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I did pick up, a lot of things. I mean, he was another great producer and, you know, that was a really valuable period and also another learning, another learning period. And, uh, it was really tremendous. And so, yeah, no, I, I learned a lot from Bo too. Um, but I guess at that point, what I learned from Bo was more, I guess, um, I'm trying to think how to put this probably, the more technical, newer era of stuff that was coming in. Um, you know, Bo's a great keyboard player, and uh, <clears throat> he used to love new keyboards and stacking sounds on keyboards and, and arpeggiators and that sort of thing, and I learned a lot from watching him working that way, and, you know, being as he was a writer as well, but he was a very different writer than Mutt, so it was it was a new you know it was a new source of information and learning you know on a different level plus at that point um everybody was getting into triggering drums and uh loops were starting and that sort of thing so uh i learned a lot from him on that level okay and then when you started doing the work for columbia that shift to working for writing for film and whatnot how was that adjustment for you? Um, it was pretty tricky at first, but I then it, it became a real challenge, and I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it, and the more the more I did it, the more I think. Uh, well, the more I felt that it, uh, it 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 actually made me a better writer and gave me a better understanding of music and. Uh, I think I grew more as a musician and a writer doing that um, because, you know, you're thrown into situations that you probably would not have chosen if you were given the choice, but because <laughs> yeah. you're a sap writer, <laughs> yeah. you can't say no. <laughs> so <laughs> you go, yeah, okay, and then how the hell am I going to do this? And yeah. uh, 
and you just have to figure it out and you just have to research and listen and do whatever you need to do and so that was something sort of in the same way as what I learned from Bo and what I learned especially from Matt being being in a completely foreign situation I mean it's okay when you're just writing a straight rock song for a film or a TV show but that only happened like 20% of the time so the rest of the time it was it was other things and uh, so again you know you have to put the time in you have to meet new people you have to do the research you have to listen to stuff you would probably not necessarily have listened to and then you know that that just improves you as a writer oh, i think to. and a musician because now you're really having to stretch you know where you wouldn't probably normally have gone that route <laughs> oh absolutely that you had to have learned so much and then you know that relationship working uh, working with uh, columbia pictures as i said introduced me to, to to new people and then i met a guy um <clears throat> rich McHugh, who uh we were we, we we did a couple of showcases and he had a band on the side so i would go and play with him occasionally in his band um and he was saying how he wanted to actually start scoring movies properly and uh really getting into that and would i be interested in doing it with him and i you know at first i said i know the first thing about this i mean full orchestras are you kidding me you know um but again, uh, he, he he got a small movie, a couple of a couple of small movies, and said, "Come on, we need to do these together." And so again, that turned into like baptism by fire, you know. And the next thing, I'm going around all the music stores trying to buy as many soundtracks from different movies as I can, and just listening to them constantly in the car. And. Uh, it's just a totally different thing for writing songs, and uh, the whole approach is different. And uh, you know, regardless of the instrumentation, it's still different. You know, because um, you can't write verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, or whatever. You've got to follow the you've got to follow the <clears throat> the theme of the music. You've got to write the theme for the the show, and then or the or, or the or the film, and then you've got to you know keep referring to that and introducing it but in different ways and uh it, so again that was like that was a whole new experience and uh and it was great because again it was just something i'd never done before uh, i mean I, I i touched on it working with columbia doing little pieces of music here and there for tv shows extra pieces for tv shows and film but not actually having the weight of the film on you <laughs> it was basically yeah, yeah going from plugging holes to actually doing it you know yeah uh, and so so that was a brilliant experience too and in some ways i don't think i could ever i would ever have come up um with some of the stuff that i did on the the second steelhouse lane album and especially my solo album if i hadn't been working in film yeah that was gonna be my next question was how did that work influence things when you went to go play you know rock music a lot a lot um i mean like i say especially with slamer the album my solo album um i just enjoyed what i'd been doing in film so much even though i wanted to to do an album again and um play more uh and do another rock record it, it, a lot of it crept in and i didn't sort of approach it the way I would have approached it if I hadn't been working in, you know, in that field, in those areas of film and TV, I would not have approached that record the way I did. So I'm really glad that that I had that experience. I think that's when you really learn when you're outside your comfort zone. Yeah, no, you do. Absolutely, it's great. Uh, one other record back in the mid-90s you did that I'm really interested in is the Michael Sweet record. Cause okay. How did you get involved with him? And, and it seems like you were, had a very... Uh, big creative involvement in that because you were playing and producing. Yeah. Um, well, Michael contacted me. I mean, he asked me, he had a lot of stuff that I'd done and he asked me if I'd be interested. And I said, uh, absolutely, I'd love to do a project with him. And he said, you know, mainly as a producer, but uh, <clears throat> I'd like you to do some playing too. 
So, you know, that was it. I mean, unfortunately, there was a lot of driving involved in doing that record because he did it in Orange County, and I live north of um, of uh, Los Angeles, so I was having to drive 80 miles each way every day in just horrendous traffic. Yes. Um, and I think <laughs> that I had so many bad experiences trying to get to the studio and trying to get home um, during that project <laughs> that uh, those are the things that more than the incidental things that may have happened in the studio. But my, I do remember Michael was a, a, a blast to work with, a really nice person, um, a wonderful guy, and uh, as easy as pie to work with. Really good guy. Did you tour at all with him for that? No. No, I didn't. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out now, in, in your timeline, so we're probably mid-90s, late-90s, is that Steelhouse Lane, your next kind of band? Uh, I think that was uh, Serafino. No, 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 that wasn't Frontiers. That was MTM. Um, MTM Records contacted me about doing that record. Uh, they just asked me if I'd like to do a record. Um, would I put a band together and do a record? Well, I didn't want to put a band together at that point because I was still working on TV and film projects. And uh, <clears throat> if you're not around for those... You know, people only call you back once and then that's it. So I wanted to stay involved in that. I didn't want to have to put a band together. So um, I think that first Steelhouse Lane album, I just decided to do on my own. And uh, it was really the, the, the main obstacle, the main objective there was to get a good singer to do that record. The first one. And actually, it was Mark Baker that turned me on to Keith, uh, to Keith Slack. So um, that's, that's when I met Keith, because he said, hey, there's this guy in Texas. He's a really good singer. You might want to give him a call. So I did, and he sent me some demos. And I said, hey, would you do this project with me? Would you sing this project? And he said, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think you touched upon something that it should be noted is that we're talking end of the 90s, which the 90s pretty much devastated rock guitar players, but yeah. you'd figured out a way <laughs> to to work your, work through it and keep working. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, luckily there were some European record companies who still wanted that sort of music. Um, and <clears throat> for me at that point, it was something that I wanted to do as well because... Um, I, as much as I was enjoying doing the other stuff in, in film and TV, I was, you know, I still wanted to, to be able to make records now and again. So uh, when this opportunity came up, I jumped on this, you know, I jumped on it. I wanted to do it. I just didn't want to put a band together because I knew I wouldn't have the time to rehearse and go out and tour and do all that stuff with the other things that I was committed to. So it was basically I would have to do it on my own when I could and then bring Keith in from Texas, you know, to, to, to work on the vocals and the lyrics and uh, with me, you know. And that's a time where you've got, yeah, you've got MTM, you've got Frontiers is starting up. You know, there's a few little little labels that have since, you know, I think MTM has gone now, but, but like Frontiers has grown in this niche to be quite a big company now. Yeah. But that was right when it was all starting, when these little niches were starting to form because... There were still fans of the music, but it was still was you know not mainstream anymore. That's right. Now, how was it working with a label like MTM back then at the early days of those labels? Um, it was it was uh, it was pretty easy. Um, I mean, when they, I mean they contacted me, they asked me if I could if I could put a project together to do something for them, and uh, I mean I think the first Steel Ass Lane album. If I remember, the majority of the songs on that record were songs that I'd already written um, with various other people for various other projects. So, right. so there wasn't a lot of work involved because, like I said, I was busy doing other things as well. So, uh, and they said, "Oh, you don't have to write that much new stuff. You know, you've got some great songs. Just, just go ahead and recut them." So, it was pretty much a no-brainer. I said, well, that's great. I'll just go back and recut these songs and get Keith to sing them, and, you know, that'll be good. You know, it'll be... At least I can get back into doing a record again. Um, 
and so that was uh, that was really how the first day of fame came you know came around. Um, and not the same with the second one because obviously when the second one came up, I didn't want to rehash a whole bunch of stuff again. So um, you know I wanted to spend the time, and I at, at that point I had the time, so I was able to spend the time actually writing and writing with Keith and also Chris Thompson. Um, you know, to get those songs the way I wanted them for the record. And then Seventh Keys, the other kind of main band, I guess you had around that time as well. How did that come together? Well, Billy and I were, all, you know, we were always great friends in streets, and we'd always kept in touch. And uh, it was just weird that Billy actually then was asked to join Kansas when Dave Hope couldn't play anymore um, or didn't want to play anymore. I can't remember if he had health problems or, or what it was, but. Uh, um, I know when Billy started playing with Kansas, um, you know, I would go out and see him occasionally when they were in LA and he would come and stay with us whenever he was in Los Angeles area. He would always come in and stay with my wife and I. So, uh, we always stayed really close and our, our families were close. And, uh, so we just had that relationship. And then I think it was Serafino who, I don't know whether he, con I think he contacted Billy and said, would Billy be interested in doing something for him, like a solo pro type of project? And Billy called me and he said, I, you know, I don't want to do a solo project, but how about you and I do something together? And I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. So then I spoke to Serafino and he said, you know, that, that sounds fantastic, let's do that. So that's, that was then, then we started on the first seventh key record. And, and then you've done a few and some, some, DVDs as well, right? Yeah, yeah. We actually went out and did a few gigs, and we did a DVD, a live show in Atlanta, and then we went to Germany and did a festival in Germany, and uh, oh, it, was, it was fantastic, yeah. No, it was really good. I mean, it was great to be able to play with Billy again, and we had some other good musicians who, who would always, uh, you know, uh, show up and want to, want, to, want to play with us, and uh, it was great. So then, throughout the years, you've kept busy with these album projects with some playing did have you continued to do scoring or other outside things like that yes no absolutely yeah yeah i still i still do uh, music libraries oh uh, right yeah for tv and uh, yeah. film um so i still i start that you know i still do that and then you know i still do albums so i'm still trying to balance the two you know be able to do a bit of both and because uh, i love making records and, and but i also love working on tv and film music so i just i'm just really trying to balance the two and uh, then i decided to start working on my own library years ago so uh, i have um i don't know i don't know how many hundreds of, of library tracks that uh, that i get that i get some use in you know uh from tv and film so uh it's just a combination of the two no i love it it's uh, it's great you know um being being involved in in such different styles of music all the time, it, I think it just it, you know it, it it helps keep keep you fresh and uh, keeps the ideas coming. Now the latest album that I have with you is Ozone. I believe that's your your absolute latest record because that only came out last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an album which I absolutely love. I think it's brilliant. Oh, Can you tell you. me a little bit about the making of that one? Um, yeah, um, that was, uh, Khalil from, uh, Escape called me, about, well, I'd worked with him before on a couple of things, and, uh, and he said, would you be interested in doing a record with both, uh, Steve and Chris? And I said, yeah, I would. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I would. I mean, you know, they're both great singers, so, yeah, I'm interested. Um, and uh, we we talked about it for a little bit. I mean, it it didn't actually turn out. I don't know if you want to print this or not. It didn't actually turn out exactly as I'd wanted it to, but it was close. Um, you know, I wanted it to be a real duet, songs written for duets, um, in sort of the old Coverdale Hughes type of uh, burn. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, so. I started writing songs, uh, you know, like So Blind and Lifetime and Visionary Man, which I thought would be great rock duet 
type songs. Um, but obviously, I didn't have the time to write a dozen of them. So, uh, you know, Tommy Denander had, had written stuff on other records that I'd done with Khalil. And uh, so he said, look, you know, Tommy's written songs with uh, Chris and with Steve. And, you know, I think we should use some of those too. So we did. And uh, But it, to me, it's just some of them are a bit poppy and uh, I would have liked to have been a little more old-fashioned rock. That's all. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That's fair. In terms of the production on it, it's got such great sounds. Is that something that you were able to do in your home studio? Yes. Yeah, I mean, everything, everything I've, you know, everything I've done in the last 20 years has come out of my studio, so... In fact, I'm, like I said in my email, I'm in the middle of building another one because we just moved three months ago. And uh, we've had a lot of issues with the house and also trying to build the studio. So uh, right before you called me, I'm, I was still wiring up and trying to find find out why certain things weren't working because, you know, once you strip a studio down that you've had for 20 years and, uh, you know, I've got a lot of vintage gear and it's all... You all have to get packed up and shipped away and put in storage, and then you know you get it out, and some stuff doesn't work, and problems with the mixer, and oh, and then I forgot how I'd wired some of it, and <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I've got notes and word documents yeah. on, you know, hey, when you do this, remember blah 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 blah, and this gets wired yeah. here, and oh. Anyway, it's it's a nightmare, but it's uh, it's coming together. I think I'm only a couple of weeks away from having it up and running, but uh, but it's been a long process because I've had to build a floating floor and all sorts of things that I didn't have to do with my last studio. So um, it's been a long process and expensive, and I've run out of money, so I've got to do a project soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump into that then in terms of the future. Ozone was your last record. Uh, which again, for people listening, I recommend you get it because I think it's really great. Um, uh, what is the future look like now for projects? Um, well, I'm 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 actually working with a new uh, a new library company, um, so I'm going to be doing some work for them um, that I'd started before I had to take my old studio apart because um, I was working on stuff after the Ozone record. Um, and so I've got to finish some of that up once the studio is running. So I've probably got about a month's worth of work once I get everything going again. And then um, both uh, Serafino at Frontiers and Khalil um, at Escape have uh, approached me about starting a project for them in either March or April. So um, I'm not going to go into details, but I'll probably definitely be doing one of them, if not both. Right. Oh, that's exciting. It's taken all my strength just to leave that alone, but I will. <laughs> I want to ask more <laughs> <Okay>. about those. <laughs> Anybody who has ever bought anything that I've ever done, I'm always, you know, eternally grateful. Um, I know I irritate a lot of fans because I don't do the Twitter, Facebook thing, but I absolutely loathe the internet. Um, <laughs> and even though. I did have a Facebook page, and my daughter's actually working on a website for me now. Oh, that's good. Yeah. She said, you know, regardless of how I feel about it, if I don't actually uh, get into this, um, uh, it could be detrimental. So anyway, she's, uh, she's working on a website for me, so I'm going to spend some time with her on that too. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll, see, we'll see where we go. But uh, I, I, I really am... Eternally grateful for anybody who's ever, ever enjoyed or bought anything that I've ever done because uh, I do try and put my heart and soul into everything that I do. And some of the criticisms I get is it always takes me way too long to do a project. And uh, that's because I'm just so passionate and meticulous about it. So uh, it's, it's part and parcel of who I am. <laughs> that was Mike Slammer. Okay, show announcement. Regular listeners will know that I've had a bit of a hard time keeping up with a weekly show since the birth of my son in December. There's been quite a few missed weeks. For that very reason, I'm going to pull back and move to having a show every second week for the foreseeable future. To be honest, it's just simply too much and it's becoming stressful. I, 
like most podcasters, don't make any money doing this. We, we all do it simply because we love it. So I need to make some changes to keep the show fun to produce. Otherwise, I run the risk of tapering off my you know excitement for doing it. But on the flip side, it'll also mean that I'll no longer be doing things like splitting up long interviews into two episodes. I really only ever did that just to buy myself some time so I could keep the show going weekly. So you can look for the next episode on March 14th. Thanks to everybody for listening and for your support and your understanding as I make this kind of change. And hopefully it won't be too long until I gear back up again and do a show a week. Well, that's it for this week. If you want to email in any show suggestions or anything at all, you can reach me at brian at the doublestop.com. I'm Brian Sor-